Hey, welcome to not the Retail Transformation Spa, but Retail Transformation Live. I'm your host, Oliver Banks, and it's a pleasure, as always, to be here with you today. We've got a really big day lined up, and I can't wait to, uh, to, to share some of the golden nuggets with you. We've got some absolutely amazing, amazing stuff. Just before we begin, drop a note in the chat box. You should be able to make sure you select it for all panelists and attendees. Let me know how you're getting on. Where are you coming in from as well? All right, just whilst you're doing that, I just wanted to share a few little bits about retail in 2020. We've got some amazing stuff. Mike, Gary, hey, how you doing? Robin, 4 a.m. Gary, well done. <laughs> Lawrence, fantastic to see you, my man. Who have we got coming in from? Oh, look at this. We've got loads of people coming in. Amazing, amazing, amazing. So here we are. We've, we've got a bit of a new look for Retail Transformation Live. Second time around. What do you think? Are you liking it? Is it working well? Well, let me tell you, we've got some absolutely, absolutely amazing, amazing stuff coming at you today. But just before we do dive into all of that, I wanted just to take a moment and just think about retail in 2020, because I'm pretty sure, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure we were all meant to be getting used to our hoverboards and our self strapping up trainers and going to the VR cinema. Isn't that what we're meant to be doing in 2020? I'm pretty sure I checked. But it turns out it's been a little stormy. <laughs> the weather's been somewhat unusual this year round. But you know what? I think we're making the most of it. So, I mean, just think about the last six months now, six months, nine days. Hoverboards were 2015, maybe. <laughs> well, so we should all be used to them by now, you see. Um, but already in the last few months, we've had Brexit. Remember that? We've had bushfires. We've had Black Lives Matter. And we've had some other things going on as well. If Harry Potter was here, he'd call it the thing that cannot be named. But hey, you know what? Retail has been going through some tough times. Remember these scenes from earlier on in the year, which were just incredibly tough to see as, as someone that just loves the retail industry. The world went kind of crazy, but there have been some good signs as well, as we'll touch on in just a minute. But it had looked like just a little bit of time. This was our strategy. I think it's um, not entirely true, though, to be honest, because actually, for me, retail has stepped up and it's worked so incredibly well. And it's the reason I love the retail industry. There have been so many, so many fantastic stories that have come out over the past few months, whether it's companies collaborating in unusual ways. You know, here we've got a screw fix truck pulling a Morrison's trailer just to help feed the nation. And how about this? Certainly if you're in the UK, you will remember this. This is all of the supermarkets collaborating together on that Feed the Nation initiative. So we had, see if I can get this all in one go, Sainsbury's Co-op, Lidl, Tesco, Aldi, Waitrose, M&S, Asda, Iceland, Morrison's, Ocado and Costcutter. <laughs> I mean, that's that. That right there is an unprecedented, unprecedented level of collaboration. And I know I know we all use that word far too much, right? Right now in particular. But all of those companies bringing together, coming together for a common purpose is, is just fantastic to see. It really is fantastic to see. And personally, I would absolutely have loved to have been in the room when they decided which logo goes where, right? <laughs> I bet that would have been an interesting, interesting conversation. But it's, it's not just that. We've seen actually the world shift and respond to retail as an industry. So for the first time ever, we've had retail toys, which have been pretty cool. Supermarket toys, um, or supermarket colleague toys, I should say, delivery driver toys, and all 
standing side by side with doctors, with nurses, with other emergency workers. And that has been, you know, for, for, for me, really fantastic to see. It's real recognition, perhaps for the first time ever, for, for, for the extreme work that, that retail does. And I know there have been so many different stories coming out about it, but I, I particularly like this one, which is the current issue of Vogue in the UK, which has Anissa Omar from Waitrose right there on the front cover. She's not a model, but it's recognizing the essential workers that are in our society. And that is proof that actually the world is waking up to the importance of retail and actually how fundamental it really is. But unfortunately, it hasn't been all plain sailing. I think sites like this, we've seen so many of in the past few years. This isn't 2020, right? You know this as well as I do. We've seen too many stores shuttering up, retail brands going under, struggling, profit warnings, redundancies, all the bad stuff that you know all about. I don't need to tell you about that. But unfortunately, I think in these, in these tough times, we're gonna see more of it, unfortunately. Um, and I think that obviously is, is, is a challenge for, for the businesses as a whole. But for, for us, the people in it, you know, whether you're working for that retail brand or whether you're perhaps working with that brand or even a customer or just a, a fellow observer in the retail industry, I think, it, you know, it, certainly I, I can only speak for myself, but it stresses me out, right? It makes me feel bad. It makes me feel like we could have done something different. And I'm not sure what, you, what your thoughts are, but for me, it poses a huge, huge philosophical question. We have to ask, are we good enough? Are we good enough? Are we good enough to be able to keep the retail industry afloat? Are we good enough to be able to change? Are we good enough to be able to serve our customers? And I think that's a critical, critical question. It's a massive philosophical question, as I say, and this should be like consuming your head. Are we good enough? And you know what? I think we are, but we have to be able to prove it. And that's kind of the whole reason, frankly, for putting on Retail Transformation Live. You know, it, this, this event was born in March out of the coronavirus, actually. <laughs> but you know what? I think, you know, so, so much has happened then and so much will still continue to happen. But we absolutely can change. We absolutely can transform. And the fact that you are right here, right now, is testament to that. It's, it's the commitment, it's the energy, it's the excitement, and it's the sheer determination, frankly, of making things happen. Now, Retail Transformation Live, I am very pleased to be working with a selection of partners. So once again, we've got Ring Central back with us, and they are powering, powering the day. Um, you've obviously got got the, uh, the, the, the app open right now and you're tuning in. So I'm really excited about working with Ring Central. Um, and we're gonna be hearing from Rene, who's gonna be talking about a really new, interesting theme or, or trend, I suppose. And that's the trend of guerrilla retail. So she's gonna be talking later on, so do make sure you check out her. That's on track two in this afternoon if you're in the UK. And if you're not in the UK, by the way, then do make sure you download one of the PDFs, which have a selection of different time zones. Um, I, I might add, we've got, we've got a really international audience, and I'll touch on that in just a little bit. We're also supported by Rotogeek today, who are the real experts in automated and optimized scheduling. And again, there's gonna be a case study panel discussion after lunch with them, looking at how Gap have actually gone ahead and really shifted their store operations and their store teams and how they all work. So really great guys over at Rotor Geek. We're also proud to be supported by Corso. 
who are an agile management system, really looking into all of the data, really helping you understand what's going on. And there's a fantastic, fantastic on-demand session with Julia Mills, which kind of blew my mind. There's some really interesting stats in there. You have to go and watch it though to find out. So too, we're, we're supported by Vicovo, who really helped to eliminate travel, which is something personally close to my heart. Having come from a sort of Lean Six Sigma background, I, I did Black Belt, um, what, 10, 10 years ago now, over 10 years ago. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's amazing. And what they're doing is, is really quite pretty cool. And again, there's a, a great on-demand session from them, as is there from Shop Happy. So uh, CEO and uh, founder, Dr. Jackie Mulligan will be joining us on the virtual stage a bit later on today, talking about high streets, but also talking about disruptive thinking. And that's gonna be a really great session. But for Retail Transformation Live, I, you know, last time we had this theme of we stand together, which was absolutely relevant for that time, because that was the time when the coronavirus was all exploding, if you remember. And actually, that spirit of collaboration was so important. And, you know, we've, we've touched on it already, right? You know, thinking about that trailer initiative or the, the Feed the Nation initiative. Um, so I think that was absolutely uh, really key for, for getting retail going. And you may remember if you tuned in last time that I did absolutely encourage you to think about, you know, being collaborative, think about engaging. And this time we're going to be looking at future fit as our theme. Now, future fit, what does it mean? Well, if we think about fitness for an individual, what would it mean for a person? It would mean about being flexible, about being nimble, strong, tough, lean, losing that bit of extra fat. Uh, having a healthy body and a healthy mind and having an intention to stay fit. So what does it mean for a retailer to be future fit? Well, it means being flexible, being nimble, being strong, being tough, being lean, losing that extra bit of fat, having a healthy body and a healthy mind and having an intention to stay fit. Yes, that's exactly right. Future fit is exactly the same, whether it's a, a person, or a company, and I think it's so important, and that's what we're gonna be diving into across the entire day. There's some amazing sessions. Now, we've got two different tracks. You'll have seen in the agenda if you've had a chance to check that out. We've got track one, which is this track right here, and you can get to it all day long, retailtransformation.live slash one. If you pop that in your browser, it will guide you back here. And there is a second track, so what should you do to join that track, I wonder? Well, it's retailtransformation.live slash two. Very simple. <laughs> but of course, Retail Transformation Live wouldn't be the virtual event to help you transform retail if it wasn't for the amazing networking that we have. So this is digital face-to-face -face networking. And if you didn't come last time and you didn't experience that, then you're missing out. So we are in for a treat. We've got a series of breaks throughout the day where you can get involved and you can see other people, meet other people, complete strangers, so you can bounce around the tables and have a conversation. So if you want to get there during the specified times, retailtransformation.live slash break. That's how it works. Now, again, thinking about live events, when speakers come, we give them a bit of love. We give them some rapturous applause to get them, get them energized. And we can do that too, using the chat box, if you don't know how to bring up your emoji keyboard, you can do, if you're on Windows, the Windows plus the full stop button, and that will bring it up, and you can find a little clapping emoji. And if you're on Apple, then that's the command, and control, and space button. And that, again, will bring up that same keyboard so you can find that clap emoji. So when we have speakers to the stage, do remember, stand up and give them a warm, warm, warm Retail Transformation Live welcome like I know you absolutely will. Chat and Q&A will be super active through the day, as I'm sure you know. And let me tell you, we've got a stellar, stellar lineup. These, I'm not gonna run through because there's just far too many, but do take a look at all their bios on the main homepage. There's some amazing people here. Really amazing, we're really truly blessed. And of course, it wouldn't be Retail Transformation Live if we weren't sharing all of our key takeaways. So hashtag 
Retail Transformation Live. Those are some of my profiles. Do tag me in, I'd love to see what you're thinking. You know, maybe take a few selfies through the day, screenshots, whatever, it'd be great to hear from you. So do remember, hashtag Retail Transformation Live. Now, that's the housekeeping stuff out of the way. And I'm very, very excited about what's just about to happen. Now, we are about to welcome our very first speaker. This is someone that is the consumer champion, someone that stands for customers up and down the country, is regularly on TV, on radio, other media appearances, and he's just got such a great understanding. He's the founder of Customer First Group, and he also runs a customer service action. Um, it's all about really understanding what customers are feeling and helping make things happen. So he's a real positive change, and I'm very pleased to be welcoming Martin Newman on to the virtual stage. Martin, I see you, and I'm gonna be bringing you up in just a second. Here we go, we know what to do, people. Let's give Martin a rapturous round of applause. So you should be up on the virtual stage. Here we are, Mr. Martin Newman, everyone. Go wild in the chat box, make sure you are giving him a ton of love. Thank you, Ollie. appreciate it. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, thanks, Ollie, for inviting me along to do a presentation for you all today. I, I can see that many of you are up early at four o'clock in the morning, Gary, wherever you are, probably in the US. So thanks for all of you uh, for joining. I have to say hats off to Ollie for some fantastic acting to begin with. Clearly missed uh, your vacation as a thespian. So, start my clock. Um, I'm going to talk about the future consumer. Uh, just a, a little word of warning. Uh, this is Dougal. He's my miniature schnauzer. And if the doorbell goes, he is going to bark his little head off. So, I'm warning you right, right now. I don't have much control over that. Hopefully, nobody comes to the, the door first thing in the morning. A little bit about me, just to build on what Ollie was telling you. Um, I've had the privilege of working for some incredible brands throughout my career. I was head of online and multi-channel operations for the likes of Harrods, Burberry, Ted Baker, Pentland Brands, of which Speedo Berkhaus and Mitre are just a few of the brands in their portfolio. I founded and built a business called Practicology, which is a consulting uh, business mainly around digital and e-commerce, which had the fortune of selling to a US company called Pattern a couple of years ago. Um, I've also got the privilege of being a board advisor with Yext, who are digital asset management and on-site search platform and Clearpay, the leading buy now, pay later provider. Um, and then finally, I'm a, a trustee on the board of InKind Direct, which is a charity that actually supports thousands of other charities. And I recently joined the board of the, of the retail arm of the Scouts as the non-executive chairman. Uh, I've written a book called 100 Practical Ways to Improve Customer Experience, shortlisted for the Business Book of the Year Awards 2019. I thought rather selfishly they gave it to someone else. But there you go, you can't win everything. And as Ollie said, you'll, you'll occasionally see my ugly mug popping up on BBC Sky and other good stations and channels. And as he also mentioned, I'm the founder of Customer Service Action in the Customer First Group. Um, and what I'm really trying to do is drive positive change for both consumers and brands. That's enough about me. I'm going to start by talking about where are we now. So unfortunately, as we've all discovered, shift happens. And coronavirus has obviously accelerated behavioral change. Some of that is permanent, some of it's temporary. We've shifted from what I would call discretionary spend, where we bought stuff because we just could, to essentials, to the stuff that we really need. I noticed that somebody had already mentioned on the chat, they've got about 10 uh, Lugo still sitting in their cupboard. So a number of us uh, <clears throat> stockpiled in the early days. Hopefully we've uh, moved on from that now. But how we feel has become far more important than who we are. And what I mean by that is it's not about traditional customer segmentation because you could be 10 years of age or you could be 50 years of age and you could be just as traumatized by coronavirus and what we've gone through. Um, and just to use an example, these two beautiful young girls here are my daughters, Saskia on the left, who is a 19 year old Gen Z activist, and uh, Antonia, who's now gone through that custom. She's a millennial, she's 24 years of age. Um, I wanted to book a restaurant for this weekend. My wife and I went out for a meal last weekend. Can I convince these two to come with me? 
absolutely no chance. And Antonia has a boyfriend and he doesn't want to come either. So there's three young adults, none of whom feel comfortable right now going into a restaurant. So who, who we are is not so important as how we feel. And that really depends on our personality. Safety has very much replaced convenience as the key driver for all of us, let's be honest. No matter how confident we are about getting back into the world, we want to make sure that we do it safely. And we've gone through this kind of phase of what I call self-preservation. I'm sure many of you remember the early stages when we were allowed out to walk for an hour a day. You know, I, I don't know about you, but I certainly felt this. When you're walking up and down the road, people didn't even want to look at each other. You were too scared to look at someone for fear of, I don't know, getting something, you know, getting coronavirus from them. But we've definitely moved on from that. And I think that that's given way to now seeds of change and this kind of whole philosophy of we're all in this together, which is much more about community and, and driving our sense of community. And we saw some of that, obviously, when we had in the UK, we had clap for the NHS on a Thursday night, eight o'clock which I think was great and really pulled everyone together and made everyone feel that we were all part of this and it was very much about being in this together. So I think this has driven a new sense of community for many of us. We also have the new normal. So we have certain things that have changed and we have same old, same old and some stuff that's just not going to go away. And uh, this is a tweet from Scott Beasley the other day, 100% keep it like this forever. These are the streets of Soho in London and the West End where they've closed the streets off to traffic and restaurants are putting tables out in the street because many of them are too small and with social distancing, they literally wouldn't be able to open. And actually people like this and consumers like this and this might be a trend that stays in the long term. And of course, you can get married again and the lovely Lucy and James, Mr. and Mrs. Bone got married at a church in Ingram, Northumberland. But unfortunately for them, they only had probably 30 guests there because that was all they were allowed to have, unfortunately. But then it probably also meant that the bill for the wedding was considerably cheaper. So maybe there was an upside. And here's a tweet from Donna Williams of the traffic chaos as caravanning was allowed again and the motorways were rammed with people going to take their caravan and go for a, a staycation somewhere probably on the coast. And then, of course, the pubs opened up last weekend. And on the left hand side, you've got the fullback, faltering fullback pub in North London, with a queue as far as you can see down the street. And then the right hand side, this is probably an average day in Newcastle, outside Black Carter, queuing up to get into the pub. So that's a little bit of kind of where we've been and some of the stuff that's happened recently. But what about where are we going? Well, I consulted a friend of mine, Mr. Albert Einstein because he famously said that if you want to look, if you want to know what the future holds, you often have to look at the past. These, this group of lovely people here, these are baby boomers, uh, born after the war in the post-war years. Um, <clears throat> and they were very much the, the vanguards of activism, if you like. So baby boomers fought for women's rights, gay rights, civil rights, and for social equality. Does that sound familiar? You recognize that in terms of today and any other groups that might have a have a similar sort of mindset. So we'll come on to that later. They also happen to live in the longest sustained period of social progress and economic growth in human history, 18 years uninterrupted by recessions, quite remarkable and pretty much unheard of. You'll be pleased to know, I actually think that after COVID, we are going to go into a similar significant long period of growth. However, we're going to have to go through, obviously, a bit more pain before we get there. What I think is going to shape retail for the next 50 years, it's not so much about what will shape retail for the next 50 years. It's more about who is going to shape retail. And I am 100% convinced that Gen Zs are going to lay the path. They're going to define what retail looks like. They're going to define what brands need to do to be relevant both now and in the future for all of us. So if you want to know what's coming, you just need to look at Gen Z. They are going to drive more change than any previous generation. You know, baby boomers probably thought that they were activists and change agents back in the 1960s and the 1970s. Well, they've got nothing on Gen Z because they are absolutely going to change the world. And of course, here's one of the best known Gen Zers and activists, Greta Thunberg. Um, and believe me, I can tell you as a, a father of a 19-year-old Saskia, who I pointed out earlier, 
she is every bit as a, 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 an activist as Greta Thunberg. And it, it really is a very much a generational community orientated movement that's going to change everything. What's going to happen in the next couple of years, two to three years? Well, I think we're going to see a bit of role reversal. So in the UK, for the best part of a decade, we went through austerity, didn't we? Government austerity, where there were spending cuts across public sector services. Well, now obviously what we're seeing is the government spending to try and prop everything up, to try and minimize job losses and, and support businesses and everything else. But I think what we're going to see over the next couple of years is consumer austerity. So we're the ones who are going to be thinking long and hard about whether we really need to make a purchase, because obviously many of us will be affected commercially as a result, sadly, of what we're going through. Many people are losing jobs and will continue to lose jobs. And for those of us that are lucky enough not to, we'll be thinking about saving maybe more than spending. But I do think we're going to move away from just buying essentials to pick me ups. We're going to be looking for those feel good moments that is still going to be good for retail. It's going to be good for leisure. It's going to be good for hospitality. It's going to be good for staycations and eventually for those of us who have uh, the confidence to go abroad as well. Sadly, I think we're going to see 25 to 50 percent fewer national retail chain stores than we have in 2019. That's a, a significant shift, um, but I think that's the reality of what we're facing into. Um, and on this page here, you can see a list of the brands who have been through CBAs, they've been through company voluntary administrations, and sadly, some of them have gone forever um, or they've been acquired by other businesses and maybe their online assets have been acquired by other businesses. But you know, if you just added up the store portfolio from all those brands and the ones that have been closed, you'd find, you'd find it in the many hundreds, if not almost in the thousands. So we're gonna see a very significant change there over the next few years. However, a good business is a good business. And I really believe you don't need 100 stores to be successful. If you were starting a retail business today and you wanted to create a national presence, you know, what would it look like? Would you have hundreds of stores or would you? I mean, here's the example of Selfridges who have four stores in the UK and a, and a very successful website. And they are fantastic, fantastically successful business in a sector that's been devastated by the change in consumer behavior that's been devastated by online and other factors, department stores. But department stores can still work and it worked for Selfridges. And it's a business that's been evolving for over a hundred years and has continually been pushing itself forward, continually reinventing itself and ensuring that it's relevant to the needs of consumers at that moment in time. I think we are going to continue this trend of staying local, working local, shopping local. And I think that that becomes a driver for what I'm calling commerce in the community. Or you might flip it around and call it community commerce. So here are a bunch of independent retail stores in and around the UK. And I think we're going to see a lot more of this in the next few years. I think we see a rebalance. So where we had a very homogenous proposition through most towns and cities in the UK with national retailers who all had, you know, every, all the stores were the same. If you went into one brand in one town and one brand in another town, it looked the same, the product was the same, the experience was the same. And I do a lot of consumer research. I go out into the high street, I interview consumers and I ask them, what do you like and what don't you like about shopping online and offline? And invariably when I ask them about the frustrations of offline shopping, they'll often, they'll often say that it's too homogenous. And that's where independent retail, I think, can plug a gap. And it can also plug a gap because the reality is the landlords are going to be left with lots of empty spaces on the high street from the national retailers who've had to consolidate their stores and reduce their store count. And I think it's the independent retailers that will fill them. And I think we're going to see a 25 to 50 percent increase in independent retailers. Now, it's impossible to put a finite number on it. But what I'm saying is I think that the balance the, the gaps left by the national retailers, many of those will be filled by small, new, innovative, independent retailers. And I think that one of the things that independent retailers also offer is what you might call the experience economy. For those of you that do shop locally and go into independent retailers, it's such a great experience, isn't it? It's almost, it's like going into an Aladdin's cave. You often don't know what to expect or what you're going to find when you go in there. And you're, you're often delighted and surprised by both the experience, because often the person who owns the business 
is the person that's actually serving you in the shop floor, um, as well as the products and everything. It's just a great experience. Um, this is an example of the experience economy, and this is uh, Casper, the mattress brand in the States, and they have created a thing called Insomnibot. So for those of you that are uh, online at the moment in America, um, maybe next time to stop you getting up at four o'clock in the morning, and you, if you do want to continue sleeping, uh, then you might phone this number, and this is basically a bot that will have a conversation with you and hopefully give you some advice and help you get back to sleep, or at the very least, just give you some company in the middle of the night. So really clever idea and a great way to bring the product to life in a relevant way. I call this the experience economy. Prior to the pandemic in the UK, we saw 19 to 20% of total retail being conducted online. Obviously, there has been a shift. And I think that where we will land, basically, when we come out of all of this, eventually, and get back to normality rather than new normality, then I think what we'll find is it will be 25 to 30% of total retail will be online. You might, you might think it'd be higher than that, but that's a huge uplift. We're talking a 25 to 30% total uplift in e-commerce sales. Massive, many tens of billions of pounds and huge implications for retailers in terms of the skills you bring into the business, um, the investment in technology, content, marketing, and everything else. The sector that's been disrupted, if you like, even more is grocery. Prior to the pandemic in the UK, online grocery accounted for about 78% of total grocery sales. I believe it will sort of land at 12 to 16%. So anywhere from 50 to 100% uplift. That's kind of where, at the moment it's about 16, 17%, but I think it's gonna land permanently between 12 and 16. So enormous implications for the grocers. And many of us all know it's been pretty hard to get a delivery slot online if you've been trying to order online from any of those brands. So what do I think? consumers actually want? What do we want as consumers from a brand that's serving us? Well, first of all, I think we want retailers to walk the talk. Um, we've been talking about putting the customer first, being customer centric, putting the customer at the heart of all we do, right? These are some of the, you know, the lingo, the buzzwords that have kicked around our industry for as long as I can remember. And it was actually the motivation for me writing my book, 100 Practical Ways to Improve Customer Experience, because I thought, what does it actually mean to put the customer at the heart of all you do? And I, I couldn't remember ever seeing a framework or something that logically described to me, how would you, what are all the different elements of the business, the value chain of the whole organization, what would you need to do in order to deliver this? And I really believe we're at a time now where consumers 100% will want, not only want, but will demand that retailers walk the talk, that we step up to the plate. This is some research from Edelman. 71% of consumers will lose trust in a brand forever if they perceive that they're putting profit over their people. Now, you just have to think about some of the media coverage of the last couple of months, and I can think of quite a few brands who have been in the media as potentially who might be ticking the wrong box in terms of being seen to put profit over people. One of our very well-known airlines, for example, using this period of time to force new contracts on their staff at a lower rate of pay. You know, I think consumers remember this and will remember it, and the brands that do behave like that will suffer in the long term. The flip side of that is in take a brand in, this, in the North, North America, the Home Depot. They trust their staff with the autonomy to give out discounts of up to $50 to customers in the store. They don't have to go and ask a line manager. They're empowered to do the right thing. Not only that, their associates are able to work <clears throat> with local organizations and charities to give back to the community. They're actually encouraged to do that. And as a brand, they support their associates in both financial emergencies and in reimbursing their tuition if they want to better themselves and go and get some further education they actually reimburse that because they see the benefit of paying for somebody to improve their capabilities and their knowledge and to retain that within the, within the business. I think that's fantastic. So what does that all add up to? Well, here's the share price of Home Depot over the last five years. And if I've done my maths correctly, <coughs> excuse me, 
it's grown by about 120% in a five-year period. Now, am I saying that's purely because they're a people-centric business and they do the things that I outlined in the previous slide? Of course, it's not just down to that. But what it is down to is clearly a culture of an organization that understands what it means to put their people first, to put their customers first. And it has a culture and a plan of how to do that on a day-to-day -day basis. And they see the results in their performance. You ultimately need to be where your customers are. That might sound obvious. And for some brands, that means being on Amazon. Now, I know that not, everybody, not every brand that's on today <clears throat> will like the idea of being on Amazon. I know for many years, I've spoken to brands who just said, you know, I don't want to be there, kind of scared by them or whatever. You know, the reality is, you know, you can live in coexistence with Amazon. You can still have your own direct consumer website and you can still be there. And the reality is that's where many of your customers are. And of course, they have acquired many more customers during this period because they've got everything essentially that people want to buy. So bite the bullet. And I think you need to be where your customers want you to be. For some consumers, as I've already pointed out, there's been a total shift. During the pandemic, there are many different customers that have bought online for the first time, whether that was older customers or some customers that just, for whatever reason, didn't fancy buying online. You know, maybe we're technology Luddites. Doesn't matter. They're now doing it um, because it's been the safe thing to do and therefore it's been the most convenient thing to do during this period. And some of that behavior will undoubtedly stick. I think we will be, we will continue to be loyal to local stores. So I live in North London. This is my local Londis. And you know you go in there, and honestly, it's incredible. I don't know how he gets so much, how they get so, so many products into that store. It's like a it's like a TARDIS uh, for those of you that are Doctor Who fans. And you go in, and almost day by day, he's been increasing the range, more and more fresh fruit and vegetables. And what he's been doing has been tapping in to the fact that many of us want to stay local and shop local, as I mentioned earlier, but we also might not feel comfortable going to one of the big grocers, going to Tesco, to Morrison's, to Sainsbury's, to Lidl, to Aldi, and so on and so forth. And we just prefer the convenience and the safety, or we feel more safe going into Londis because there are fewer people in there. He only lets two people in at any one time. And I think it's really important as consumers that after this, we continue to support those businesses who, who went the extra mile to make sure that they were there to serve us. I also think the national retailers need to behave like independents. I was actually talking about this on the BBC a couple of weeks ago. And what I mean by that is, if you go back to what I said earlier about national retailers having a very homogenous proposition, I think you, know, you can still have multiple stores throughout the UK, but you need to be hyper-local. And when I say hyper-local, I mean empower the person that runs that store to localize the proposition. You know, give them the responsibility and the accountability to merchandise the store they want, the way they want to merchandise it, to maybe suggest additional products that might not be bought across the whole, you know, the whole store estate. So talk to buying and merchandising and talk about some of the nuances in your area. Give them some, some control and empowerment over marketing. Let them engage through social media channels. Why wouldn't you do that? Because if your customers are going to stay local and shop local, you're going to have more chance of engaging with them effectively if you start to behave like an independent retailer. <clears throat> I was thinking about this the other day. You know, this is the John Lewis store in St Pancras train station in London. You know, it's basically, I think, about 3,000 square feet. It's obviously a, a tiny corner of the size of their department stores, of their normal stores, their full stores. Why aren't brands like John Lewis doing this in locality? I live in High Barnet. Why, why isn't there a, a small John Lewis in High Barnet? Is there any reason for there not to be? You know, again, why can't John Lewis and all the other national retail chains think more locally, behave more locally, and have smaller format stores? They can be equally as successful and continue and enable them to continue to drive the engagement of customers. I 100% believe that brands have to put purpose before profit. I think if you go the wrong way around and you focus on profit first and purpose becomes an afterthought or a tick box exercise, you ultimately don't deliver the level of profit that you want. Brands with a clear sense of purpose have enjoyed a 175% increase 
in their brand valuation over a 12 year period, according to Kantar. <clears throat> that is 100% more than the brands who didn't. So brands without a purpose, they still grew, but they only grew at 70% compared to those with a clear sense of purpose. Take a brand like Patagonia. Um, this is the homepage of their website. More often than not, when you go onto the Patagonia website, for those of you that don't know, I'm sure most of you do, they're an outdoor retailer, okay? So any products for camping, fishing, sports, etc. you know, you can get them from Patagonia. But they're not selling products on the homepage. What are they doing? They're talking about the Guachin, which is an indigenous population in Alaska who are being uprooted from their environment by oil companies who are coming in to basically drill for oil and having a huge impact on the life of this community, but also on the environment and everything else. And Patagonia is a purpose-led, cause-led business. It also happens to be an extremely successful and sustainably profitable business over many, many years. And they would be one who would probably, I think would be considerably north of that 175% increase, which I spoke about on the previous slide. I believe that to be successful, your values are more important than value. And I also believe that that is genuinely important to many consumers, maybe not all, but to many. So what I mean is what you, how you react, how you act, what you stand for, I believe for many consumers, that's actually more important than price. You might not believe me. Let's see if I can prove the case. Morrisons are paying farmers and small suppliers immediately to help them with their cash flow. Unlike other brands, like pubs, well-known pub chains in the UK, that might end in spoons, who decided that they wouldn't pay their suppliers until they were open again, you know? And that's gonna cause the death of many of their suppliers. Morrison's recognize they need these brands as part of their supply chain, but they also recognize the importance of supporting them and supporting the community. The market also pays attention to values. It's not just about consumers. Many of you will have heard this week about uh, the issues, factory issues around manufacturing and the wages that people are getting paid who are producing you know, products for Boohoo. Uh, and their share price is tanked. It's on the way back. But over the last five days, four or five days, it's gone down 45%. It's coming back 20, 25% up today. And it will continue to come back because they're a good business and they're a successful business. And I'm sure they will do the right thing or they'll sort this out. However, it just shows you what can happen if you aren't focused on purpose and values, making sure that everybody else that's in your supply chain is doing the same thing. Volkswagen, on the other hand, well, many of you will remember the sort of greenwashing scandal in the US <clears throat> when they tried to tell consumers that the cars had low emissions and then they realized, and then we, we found out that the cars were rigged. And this is what's happened to their stock price basically over the last five years since that scandal. It's essentially down 35%. It has never recovered and it may never recover. And that's not because Volkswagen cars are, are all of a sudden undesirable. You know, it's still a highly desirable brand in principle. The cars are, many of them are performance orientated, but the reality is it turned many, many consumers off from buying a Volkswagen because they just don't trust them anymore. And again, here's some examples of brands that maybe haven't done what they could have done during this period, where, where it's Whole Foods, who are staffed to donate their sick days. I talked about this, Weatherspoons refusing to pay suppliers before the pub reopened, or McDonald's putting dividends to their shareholders before their staff. They were laying off staff, but they were still paying dividends to their shareholders. I did some research of uh, nearly 2,000 consumers about six, six weeks to two months ago, and 72% of consumers said they would boycott a company based on their behavior during coronavirus. Now, in reality, do I believe that 72% will not go back to any of those brands? Of course not. But it might be 20%, it might be 25%. You know, again, go back to Volkswagen. <clears throat> it ultimately changes behavior and it will have turned some customers off for life. Why would anybody want to do that? Don't understand. When it comes to marketing, I think that to be effective and to truly engage with customers. We need to move more to perspiration. We need to, need to move to real life and away from the traditional aspirational advertising. So I think what you're gonna find in the next few years is a lot less of this 
a lot less of celebrity led and even opinion leader led or opinion former led advertising and much more to real world people kickboxers boxers you know this is dove my beauty my say i mean this lady is not wearing a lot of makeup but who cares right she's wearing dove product she's a boxer she works out she keeps fit she's real and consumers can engage with her they can empathize with her and they can trust it more than an aspirational advert that let's be honest most of us these days know we're not going to look like julia roberts we're not going to look like these celebrities but we probably look much more like these real life people your customers are diverse and so must you be take the example of apple so many many brands as you'll have seen over the last few weeks with the whole black lives matter movement and everything that's been going on not just in the us but globally many brands have come out and obviously expressed the fact that this is important that you know the black community cares black voices care they listen to them and that they're doing something about it right and that's fine but then you look at the board and you don't see any black faces on the board and that's clearly an issue and that's a case of a brand not walking the talk so that leads to what i call the elephants in the boardroom and unfortunately today there are still many boardrooms around the country here in the us and beyond and other european markets where the boardroom looks like this pale male and stale uh, unfortunately as you could probably tell i'm pale i'm male and i'm kind of their age so i'm also a little bit stale um, and that doesn't cut it anymore why doesn't it cut it because it's not representative of the customers that they're selling to women drive 70 to 80 percent of all consumer purchasing decisions therefore why is that boardroom full of men why is it that in the FTSE 250 in the UK the 250 biggest businesses in the United Kingdom only two percent of the CEOs are female the last time I I checked in the FTSE 350, there were only 12 female CEOs. And believe it or not, that over the last two or three years, that had declined from 18 female CEOs. So despite the fact there's a lot of awareness of this and there's a lot of focus on it, it's going the wrong way. And I don't understand why it's going the wrong way. And of course, it doesn't just relate to uh, the people that are running our businesses and the gender of the person running our business. It relates to how people are paid. So there are lots of issues there for brands to fix. What I want to talk about now is the CEO <clears throat> as a change agent. What retailers have been doing over the last few years is bringing in somebody and calling them the chief digital officer or bringing in the role and calling it the transformation director or the director of transformation. Or, or for those who do want to be truly customer centric, they bring their role in and we call it the chief customer officer. Now, all of these jobs are entirely relevant and I'm not dissing any of them. They're entirely relevant roles, but those people can't possibly drive the change required in a business in order, whether it's you want to be digitally, you want to transform digitally and, and upgrade your capability or whether you want to become completely customer centric. No one person is going to be able to do that, that you bring into that role. And the, and the reality behind that is that all the other directors in the business that run their different parts of the business are all being measured on different things. They all have a different focus. They have different objectives, different KPIs that are not about what those roles are trying to deliver. That is why the person that has to be the change agent, I think, in the business has to be the chief executive officer. In my opinion, the most successful leaders in any business are those who facilitate others. Are those who recognize their job is to make somebody else's life easier to do their job. That's how I always see my role in the businesses that I run. And I think that has to be the focus of a CEO. However, CEOs also need to be empowered. And by that, I mean, they need to be given the tools to do the job. So the majority of CEOs that are still running retail businesses in the UK, in the US, in France, Germany, Spain, Italy, Australia, China, and everywhere else around the world are being incentivized and targeted by their stakeholders, whether that's the chairman, whether that's a private equity company, whether that's, a, if it's a public listed business, the institutional investors, they are being targeted on what happens in the next 12 months. 
And if you're being targeted on what happens in the next 12 months, and not only are you being targeted on that, but your bonus and your remuneration and everything is linked to that, surely you're not going to make investment decisions that might not pay back for two or three years, but decisions that you should be making to, in order to take the business where it needs to get to, to transform, to transition, to become customer centric. So that is a conflict, I think, that you know has to be resolved. I also think you there is an opportunity for many businesses to go global but act local. <clears throat> there is absolutely no point whatsoever in you know launching an English language website in Germany or France that are both strong nationalistic countries and um, pay, 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 paying in pounds, not in euros and no, no local language, okay? So that's the start of the journey. So what I would advise is to work with, you know, one of the, the cross-border solution providers like eShop World, who can help you to localize the checkout, they can help you to localize language, content, marketing, and all aspects of the customer journey. And I think you need to do that in order to be really relevant for the needs of customers in local markets. But I do think it's a big opportunity to expand the reach of your brand. And I don't think you need to be a national retail business to be doing that. You could be a small independent retailer who could still start to promote yourself to those other territories. I, I, I use this phrase, I'd like to think I coined it, but uh, who knows, but I used this in an article I wrote for Retail Week going back to 2013. I, was, I used to have a column and, <clears throat> excuse me, what I was trying to say is, that our focus is always on bringing people in the door, isn't it? It's always on bringing customers in, it's on acquisition, it's on the top of the funnel. And once they come in and once they bought something, we kind of almost forget about it. <laughs> you know, I mean, you think about your own experience from all the brands that you buy from online, for example, how many of you genuinely get personalized marketing communication, emails that relate to who you are, what you like, what you don't like, what you buy, what you bought, what you want to buy, what you aspire, what you aspire to, the content you've engaged with, and so on and so forth. Let's be honest, you could probably count it on one or two fingers, the amount of brands that are truly personalizing. And as a result, I think that lack of focus on customer retention means that our customer lifetime value diminishes massively, customers churn massively, so we invest all that money on bringing them in the door, not enough in making sure they come back, and guess what? It doesn't pay off. According to the Harvard Business Review, a 5% increase in customer retention leads to a 25 to 90% increase in profit. Wow, wow. So 5%. So if I focus more on customer retention and I can grow it by 5%, I might increase my profits by 25 to 95%. That is it's huge, it's game changing. Um, and I think if you, if you did the maths on that in your business, you realize the implications of that and the commercial upside of that, both in your sales and your profitability. And that would become very much your starting point. You know, if I were you, I'd start with customer lifetime value and I'd kind of work back from there. I wouldn't do it the other way around. And so I think we have to move from retail to retail. And that's, these are actually not my slippers, but I managed to find a pair of slippers with a letter M on. But, you know, again, we've been talking about personalization. We've been talking about customer relationship management, CRM, for 20 years. We've been talking about personalization for 20 years, but we're just not doing it. And I really believe that consumers want it and they respond well to it. Now, you know, the best things, the most practical example of that, I should have maybe mentioned when I was talking about my local Londis. When I walk in there, he knows my name. He knows my family. He asks after them. He knows what I like. He has my papers ready for me on a Sunday. He has the sweets ready for me. I'm a chewing gum addict. He's always got these tubs looked out for me when I walk in. You know, it's personalization. You don't need the most expensive technology in the world to be able to personalize the experience. You just need to have the right mindset and people focused on what the right thing to do is. And that's a pretty good starting point. And the final thing I want to talk about is, is turning customers into fans. Um, again, that's kind of taking personalization on to the next level. You know, how do we move on from having, from going from having limited, very limited customer loyalty to really driving customer attention through personalization? 
but how do we go to the next stage? How do we make people fans of the business? And I often use this example. This is my local barbers, who I was thankfully able to get to uh, earlier on this week for my first haircut in three months. Might not look like it, but it was, uh, it was a bit of a mullet before this. Um, this barber shop is called Eagle Barbers. They're in Cockfosters in North London, okay? There are five Greek Cypriot barbers, okay? This is not a national chain. This is one barber shop, one barber shop in Cockfosters with five barbers. Look at their Instagram page. They've got nearly 240,000 followers. They built a global brand through basically being good at what they do, great haircuts, sharing them online. They now go around the world, the, the country flags that you can see there, they go around the world and they deliver training in South America, in Brazil, in Sweden, in the States, in Europe, in the Far East. They're like rock stars. They, this is the, the example on the right here is one of the smaller sessions. I've seen videos where they walk out on stage and there's like a thousand people in Brazil in the room, you know, adoring them basically, on their feet, clapping them as they, as they walk out on stage to cut hair and, and show people how to do a better job of that. And they're also now creating a range of products that they're gonna be selling online. They're just such a fantastic example of a, a small, a tiny independent retailer creating true global reach. So I think this sort of opportunity is there for anyone that wants to take it. You just need to get out there, you need to create the content, you need to get your brand out there, get onto social media channels, and I think anybody could potentially deliver that. I hope you enjoyed it. I, I hope that's a, a good starter for the day. I can see quite a lot of questions coming in. Um, I'm delighted to say that I think I've got probably about five minutes or so to answer some questions now, but I'm also going to be around um, in the networking break at 11 o'clock if anybody wants to ask me any more questions. And if for any reason you don't have the opportunity to do that now, then here are my contact details. I'm only too happy if you want to send me an email um, I'd be happy to come back to you if you want to link in with me. Or follow me on any of my channels. There's my TV channel, my uh, Consumer Focus podcast channel, or you can follow me on Twitter. So I hope you enjoyed it. Over to Ollie, and I think you might field some questions now. Wow, that was absolutely amazing, Martin. And I've just been looking at some of the, some of the chat messages go through. It really resonated with a lot of people. So thank you so much oh, for really kicking off the day in such an excellent way and dropping a boatload of golden nuggets for everyone just to, to hoover up right from, the, right from the off. So thank you so much. Um, I'd love it if people could drop in. Uh, we've got, like, like I say, a couple of, couple of minutes for some Q&A, so it would be fantastic to hear what's on your mind. Pop that into the Q&A tab rather than the chat tab because the chat tab's going crazy and I can't keep up, if I'm honest, but I will be absolutely reading it all later on. <laughs> And also, why not share some key takeaways uh, with Martin, at Martin Newman on Twitter, as you were saying. And remember, hashtag Retail Transformation Live. It's going to be great to see uh, what you're thinking about, what you're reflecting on from just some incredible content Just uh, that we've uh, just had the real pleasure. So I see we've got a question coming in. Yeah. Um, so who do you think does personalization well? Well, I, I just knew that was going to come up there, wasn't it? Because I was, I was kind of, re I was kind of hammering that one. Um, look, I mean, I, I'd say at a basic level, you know, Amazon does it reasonably well. However, there's also a slide that I often use that I didn't have on this deck, which is a, a tweet from a lady who uh, kept getting emails from Amazon trying to sell her different toilet seats after she after she bought a toilet seat. <laughs> um, we all love so, that example. Yeah, exactly. So even the great behemoth that is Amazon. Uh, the algorithms don't always get it right. Um, <clears throat> I think Shop Direct and some of the Shop Direct brands, um, when you go on when you go on the website, um, you get you get relevant content and it and it sort of builds up its knowledge of you. So when you go on the website and then when you buy something, I think they're doing you know very and uh, the other brands that they have, I think are doing a better job than most when it comes to delivering you know relevant content. But like I said, personalization could be as simple as just taking the time to get to know somebody, you know, if you've got a, if you've got a physical store or, or if, you're, if you've got a physical store and you're online, you know, do you have to be, you might be an independent retailer with one store and you might have a website and you might have a couple of thousand people on your, your database. You know, do you have to be sending the same email 
to all of those customers every week just trying to push stuff? Or how, how effective might it be just to pop an email out and say, how are you getting on? I hope you're keeping well, you know, during this difficult period and all your family are well and, you know, look forward to seeing you again at some point and just, you know, showing empathy, if you like. So I think mm. personalization doesn't have to be done, something that's achieved on scale. It can also be delivered in a very practical sense. Yeah, and I love that, love that tip as well. There's too, too many retailers email shots. They're all just buy some stuff, buy some stuff. And that's just not, <laughs> it's not going to resonate when, when, you know, your customers just get used to it, right? They get, they yeah. get washed, washed through. So we've got another question here, just sticking with that same personalization theme. What do you think is holding some retailers back from performing effective personalization and targeted marketing? I think it's focus, you know, I, th I think it's the realization. I think if, if you're a business and you're, and, and you start with customer lifetime value rather than cost of acquisition, then you behave very differently. So if I, if you're my target Ollie and I'm thinking, well, you know, based on, cause I know I've got some other people that might look a little bit like Ollie and over, over three years, over two years, I reckon they might be worth, you know, a thousand pounds, 2000 pounds, 2000 pounds or more to me as a brand, then I'm going to go and try and find more people like you, but I'm also going to make sure that I do all the things that made you loyal in the first place. And I'm going to focus on delivering the right experience and personalization as part of that. Whereas if I'm focusing on bringing you in the door and all I'm worried about is ROAS and return on advertising spend, and I'm not thinking about what you do next, then the chances are I'm not going to build your lifetime value. I'm not going to be focused on personalization. So I really believe a lot of it is just down to having that focus at the right level. And that's also why I think you need a CEO who is the change agent and the CEO who ultimately is behind this mm. and sees the value in doing this and also playing, playing the long game and is empowered to do that. So I think that's part of it. I mean, you know, there, there are plenty of tools out there that can deliver personalized content online now, can deliver, you know, personalized experiences through marketing. So I don't think there's... I don't really think there's an excuse not to be doing it. I think it's just about the focus on where it sits within the business. Yeah, absolutely. And one very last quick question here. Um, so we've got a question. Do you think that supermarkets could fall victim to FMCG brands going direct to consumer online using fulfillment partners? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, Look, I mean, ultimately, if you, again, from a, from a customer value proposition perspective, you know, why does Amazon work so well? Amazon works so well because they make it easy. Why do they make it easy? Because you can buy anything from them. That's why it says A to Z underneath the logo, because they do everything from A to Z, right? And they get it to you quickly, and you can buy prime delivery, and yada, 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 right? So if I extrapolate that out and apply it to... Tesco, Asda, Morrison, Sainsbury's, and so on and so forth. You know, do I think the world and their dog are going to start buying directly from a brand when you can buy maybe not quite as much as you could do from Amazon, but you can still, from a grocery point of view, buy all your FMCG products from those brands rather than go direct to the brand? No, I don't. I think most people will still buy from the supermarkets. However, there is definitely an increasing opportunity for an FMCG brand to build our relationship, to build engagement. And there are some categories of products where that could be, where there, where there may be more of an opportunity to take some more of that market share directly yourself. Um, but ultimately those brands obviously want to be available in the grocers as much as they do now having that direct contact with the customer as well. Super, that's really interesting. And I see there's other questions coming in. So why not hit Martin up on Twitter Martin Newman is his uh, username, Twitter handle. Um, so yeah, do continue to keep the conversation going. There's loads of people have just got so much stuff to share. So um, thank you so much for getting involved. I love, love, love just the full on engagement that we get here. So um, thank you for playing a part in that. And Martin, thank you for, like I say, delivering so many golden nuggets.